Um, I'm kind of curious. Have, have you? Uh, you're looking at the uh, extension points page. Yes, I am. Um, have you looked through oh, Evernet's deprecated? Um, yes, I did. Plugin deprecation list. Uh, yeah, that is a pretty cool thing. Uh, I don't have it handy, but. Yeah, it would be quite nice to be able to dive through and uh, start hunting down those uh, deprecated uses of extension points because there are a lot of them. Yeah, I thought that was uh, one of the better things I've seen recently. One of the things I was going to ask is if, you know, Stephen referenced this page earlier as well. I'm wondering if this page is properly highlighting all of the deprecated extension points, or if they're omitted. Um, like, is everything on, on this page usable right now? Uh, I think this is page is like periodically generated, so that information should probably be, should probably exist. Yeah, it's generated by the extension finder. Right. But yeah, that's that's a lot of uh, deprecated API usage. Wee. <laughs> ah, my take on plugin testing best practices. Uh, find somebody who knows better about testing than me and get their opinion. That's my best practice. Uh, it's a really really good question. There is no really well-defined answer for how to best test uh, plugins. I know I'm pretty crap about the ones that I do uh, that aren't public, especially the ones that aren't public. Um, no, no, it's, 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 it's a really interesting question. I, we, we have the test harness, which works, so you can run, uh, you know, it, your plugin in Jenkins in a test, but what does that really mean? What exactly are, uh, are we testing? It's, uh, it's a good question. Uh, oh yeah, forgot to repeat. The question was about testing best practices. And now there's uh, people poking at each other over uh, Makito versus PowerMock versus Jenkins rule versus who knows what. And I'm expecting Tyler to just start saying Spock randomly. <laughs> Not that I begrudge any of these. Us. I, I have no strong opinions on test frameworks. Uh, well, so if uh, if you look at the, and I'm not saying you specifically, Andrew, but if you look at Steven's uh, session today or yesterday once they're posted on YouTube, they both um, it covered some testing using the JUnit rule, um, Jenkins rule, which stands up the, um, stands up sort of an embedded Jenkins instance to run integration tests against. We also talked about the acceptance test harness, um, which is on the Jenkins CI GitHub organization, which is more for driving, you know, web-oriented Selenium-type uh, acceptance test through the UI. And then, Stephen, I think we may have missed it in uh, this morning's session going through the web client integration test as well. Did we? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, yeah, so we did go over something called the acceptance test harness. Um, so this is like your, like a very, uh, like, simple you know, just similar to like, uh, you know, unit testing and like a small type of integration testing. Um, however, there are things like the uh, acceptance test harness, uh, let me check, which is, uh, like if you go to the wiki page, it kind of, there's like some videos on how to kind of write uh, a unit test. So it's like the uh, Selenium testing. Um, if that's kind of what you were like looking for more. Um, is, the, is the page that Andrew has up right now, the unit test wiki page, um, is this up to date enough for people to, to start in on here? Um, I think so. So this is the uh, 
scroll back up. So this is oh, this is doing the uh, web client stuff. So this was something that um, I was going to kind of show a little bit, but I decided not to. It's um, so this is kind of like doing something similar. It uses so that's just one of the things that it does. It's right. This covers a pretty broad array of uh, dev test techniques. Oh, okay. So I see the. Um, okay. So it covers more of that. The page that I saw was the web asserts and things like that. So I immediately thought it was the only HTML. So yeah. So down below it has you know the option to test with the plugin. Uh, you know, without Jenkins. So, you know, if you have local data like um, a zip file uh, that contains like the job configuration and things like that, you know, it's you can easily add those. Ah, uh, Hudson test case. I remember Hudson test case. <laughs> That's where I started. <laughs> Uh, the glaciers receded, and no, 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 no. That was my hairline that receded. <laughs> I, um, uh, just for for the folks on the stream, I've been keeping track of some notes and some links in the Etherpad, which is etherpad.osuosl.org/jenkins-hacksgiving. So as we go through some of these wiki pages, I'm adding them to that. And uh, those I'm adding to the Hacksgiving page at the end of the day as well. Um, so if you miss something, it's no big deal. It'll be in the notes. So what might be uh, what might be something interesting to go through is the um, there's a couple of like reports and I would say shared resources that we have running in Jenkins on Jenkins. I mean the extensions points page is generated automatically. The, um, you know, the update center is generated automatically. There's that plugin compat uh, job that's running around. I think there's a lot of these things floating around in the Jenkins uh, infrastructure that can be useful to plugin developers, but are somewhat hidden. Yeah, what I, you're I, looking I, at right now, these libraries is also another good kind yeah. of hidden thing of libraries. Uh, well, the fact that I can't figure out where the stuff you're talking about is. Oh, it's sorry. usually on ci.jenkinsci.org. Oh, that's right. We right. haven't moved over there. Do do do. Aha! That's the all failed tab, so it's okay that they're all red. Also, most of them are red most of the time anyway. <laughs> Whee! Yeah, plug-in compat tester hasn't run in three years. Let's pay attention. No attention to that one. That's. Uh, I think that's where the acceptance test line is kind of yeah. uh, took over. So that. I'm not right. sure where that's running these days. Uh, Acceptance test harness is running in the dev at cloud instance. Uh, <laughs> back over to, to that. Back it's more tabs. More tabs for the tab god. Uh, and where's that? Plugins? Ah, too many plugins. <laughs> what are you looking for? The exception is stuff. really cool. So if you go, I think, to core. <laughs> Aha, acceptance test harness. It does stuff. I like it when things do stuff. Well, sometimes. Stephen, can you explain what this job does for the class, myself included? Um, so I think this is actually just running the... Um, so the acceptance test harness, what it does is um, it... It does again the kind of like the click interaction for like a specific. Um, I think there's like a specific set of plugins in there uh, that uh, let's see, like there's the subversion plugin, there's probably like the Git plugin, and a few other ones. They just do the like your basic, you know, UI clicking, um, 
and right. So like they have like different scenarios, and you know if you click on one specifically, um, you know. I, okay, so I guess so this. I, oh, sorry. I I have a feeling that. Um... And I could be misremembering that this acceptance has tarnished repository, and I put a link in the notes in the sidebar, is used by the LTS team as well, isn't it? Uh, yeah, so this is used by the LTS team to make sure that there's, uh, so that the instances are, uh, so your LTS line is, you know, uh, passing. Uh, so at least the acceptance test, you know, they run on the LTS line as well. Should so yeah, developers be adding stuff into the acceptance test harness repository? Um, yes. So yeah, that's something we should have a blog post about. <laughs> I didn't even know that. And now I want to go write some. Well, now you know. Now I know. And knowing is the, an eighth of the battle. Inflation. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so oh, it looks like it's... Red lasers. It looks like it's uh, got some logic in here for actually testing uh, the plugin. That's kind of nice. Right. So it's like the it tests to make sure that you know it's stuck. Or abort. You know, if it's stuck, you know, abort if it failed or something like that. So it's doing yeah. a lot of things. I have to play with this. Yeah. Is it possible, and, Stephen, to add Selenium tests like this into the uh, plugin repository directly, or should people be adding them into the acceptance test harness repository? I, I would recommend adding them to the acceptance test harness repository. Yeah. Um, I, the, I, oh, go go ahead. ahead. So I was also going to mention, too, that this there are some uh, tests in here that actually do things uh, more detailed. So. Uh, there's like Docker containers that spin up uh, LDAP uh, environment, um, so you can kind of see, you know, you know, that it has like a very basic LDAP instance, and you know, we test against that, um, so you and can write like a unit test for that specifically. And look, Tyler, it's the test library you should be advocating, given the name. Spock. Cucumber. You, Tyler names all of his veg, all of his uh, machines after vegetables. So. <laughs> He's a strange man. He is. Yeah. So I guess that's something I should have looked into more before uh, we did this. I'm gonna put that on my list of things I need to dive into more that have really evolved since I was last deeply involved with the project day to day because yeah I mean one thing that I think has always been a problem with Jenkins plugin and core testing is that we have uh, very little actual unit tests especially in core uh, it's almost all test harness stuff mm -hmm. and I think that's I'm not sure how bad that is except if you want to actually say Link up Cobertura, um, <clears throat> which now that I realize that Stephen is the maintainer of Cobertura, guess what you're going to get to do? You can use <laughs> code coverage tools with Jenkins Rule. Oh, it, it actually will, will it hook up the core test stuff mm -hmm. to core source? That's the yeah. Slide, okay, yeah, it matches that, up sources. That used to be my uh, the bane of my existence for about a month, where I was trying to figure out a way to make that work, and then ran away screaming. I mean, that was years ago. As far as I know, it works. I mean, we have we have it configured with Jococo for cloud based plugins. So. Oh, well, so let's, let's take a look at that. Fine, so. Yeah, it looks like the the. I guess what I would say then is treat the. It does not work for acceptance tests. Well, yeah, of course, uh, and so this is. Me speaking as if I have authority, uh, anybody else can contradict me. I'd say that within the plugin itself, focus on testing your functionality. Think of it as unit tests, even if it isn't really true unit tests, um, since you are running it in a Jenkins rule context, etc. Uh, 
And think of the acceptance test harnessed as the integration testing, as the making sure that your plugin actually works in a specific version of Jenkins, et cetera. Uh, does that sound with other, with other plugins? Yeah, with other plugins. Yeah, in a, in a more developed context. Acceptance tests can also they can also test live class loading behaviors, which currently Jenkins rule doesn't really handle properly. Um, and it's also better for testing UI controls. Cool. There, so there are a few <coughs> there are a few kind of corner cases where acceptance tests can probe things that you can't really get at with Jenkins rule functional tests. But yeah, I know. I have tended to avoid uh, the the HTML unit stuff and the uh, screen scraping and round trip configuration stuff when I've written tests because it's kind of like, well, if it works when I try it by hand, I'm not really going to worry about whether it works in the automated context. There's too many other things about the actual functionality that I care more about. Um, well, actually, they, they, they write tests with configure and trip all the time. That's a better place to put it. I write tests with configure and trip all the time using Jenkins rule. Um, and it's actually... Oh, I'm just talking useful. about my personal tendencies. Yeah, I'm just saying for things... It, basically, any time you have a configuration form, it's good practice to add a corresponding configure and trip test. And this is relatively quick to run. It doesn't require you know, any external Selenium setup or anything like that. It can be right part of the plugin source base, and it will catch all sorts of regressions in your usage of form controls and that sort of thing. So it's a relatively cheap and effective way to, to prevent things from going wrong. Especially if you're doing anything, if you have to think for more than a second about what you're writing in a jelly file, then you should probably be using that. I try really hard not to have to do that. That's totally hell. Um, so jumping away from the testing for a moment, mm -hmm. the reason why the extensions points page is my favoritest thing ever is this. The fact that not only does it list all the extension points, but you can find their freaking implementations, um, which for me is just huge because I can figure out what is doing something similar to what I am want to do, What's where's an implementation of an extension point that I uh, know I want to extend but don't really know what that means or know what the code really would look like. It's a cr giant crib sheet. Uh, and I can't live without it when I'm doing plugin development. Um, and in the old, old days, when I would just have the SVN check out of the entire tree, uh, then I just crept everything. But no, you know, there's um, but I would I do. I mean, this is great. This is perfect for finding extension points specifically. But if you're just interested in code patterns generally. Um, it's possible to add a carefully constructed URL to your browser search bar so that if you just go to the search bar and type GitHub tab and then you type in some class name or distinctive function name or something like that, it'll immediately do a GitHub search across all of Jenkins CI, where I include CloudBees repos too. Could um, you send that to Tyler so he can put it in the notes? Yeah, it's actually on the wiki, I think. So there's a wiki page called Grepping Jenkins Sources. I'm not sure if it specifically has a hint for the the search bar, but it yeah, does yeah. have. Uh, yeah, that, that link at the very bottom. And, ooh, look at that! And yeah. of course, the absolutely demented uh, backend merge all repo, yeah. which <laughs> doesn't work about 80% of the time. Right. And shouldn't work 100% <laughs> of the time because 1,100 freaking plugin repos is too much. Anyway, if you take the last link there and delete the some class dot static method and just keep the rest of that URL, and make th and you can create a um, and replace it with I think percent s or something like that, then you can create a uh, a browser search shortcut, which is right takes a few minutes to do and it pays off many many times. I agree. Jesse showed me this, and it's it's very powerful for like quickly searching to all the repositories. I will so, have to set that up because yeah, that definitely does seem useful. Yeah. Uh, 
So one question that uh, nobody's asked that I'm going to answer right now is, should I write a new plugin for this thing? And my answer is going to be probably not. There are too many plugins. Um, that I did, basically, my philosophy on whether a new plugin is merited is, is there nothing that does what it does, or some subset of what it does, et cetera? Uh, then, yes, obviously a new plugin if it's a new space. Uh, or if it's supporting a new, like, like, it makes sense to, if there's a new code coverage tool, to have a new code coverage plugin. Um, but if your functionality overlaps with another plugin, see if you can combine your plugins, see if you can find a way to work with them, the, whoever's the existing maintainer, or if there isn't one. Uh, ask nicely and uh, in on the dev list, and you can probably adopt it uh, to see if you can meet your needs uh, within the existing plugin. See if you can contribute to the existing plugin, um, because one yeah, the, um, one of the things that I think has been an interesting development over the past two or three years, I would say, is the proliferation of library type plugins. And I think the, the workflow suite that, that Jesse's been working on is probably one of the best examples of this to where, um, you know, there's, there's workflow common, I think it is. Um, and there's sort of a base set of plugins. And, you know, instead of what we used to do, say, four years ago, where there would be the Git plugin, which had every single thing under the sun that even touched Git inside of it, now we have the Git client plugin, and there's specific GitHub plugins that, that tailor to specific functionalities. And from my perspective, and, and Jesse, you're definitely more experienced uh, in this area than me, I, I find that the, the problem is not necessarily the number of plugins. The problem is when you have two plugins which are mostly overlapping that have wildly divergent you know, client libraries underneath to where they're just built so differently that there's no possibility to merge them or to, you know, coalesce efforts in the future. Um, yeah. that, that, I think, has been pretty cool over the past couple of years. Uh. So old that, man yells at cloud. Well, <laughs> no, this isn't old man yells at cloud. This is a other variant of the theme. This is the dear Mr. President. There are too many states these days. Uh, but no, I think that the the move to a library uh, for common functionality in a thematic area is a really good thing. That's uh, definitely fits with some of what I'm talking about. Where why. It doesn't make sense to reinvent the wheel for Git in five different plugins that are all doing, where, where they all have, may have 20% that's different, but they have 80% that's the same. Uh, but still, even then, we have too many plugins. Plugin discovery is hard, as I'm sure everybody knows. Um, and we still end up with that overlap uh, and duplication. So think hard before you actually do your own plugin. Um, uh, there's probably a plugin you can uh, find that already exists that does a lot of what you want that is abandoned that you can take over. I just helped somebody do that with the play plugin uh, in the last week. Uh, uh, any other questions? Or are we just going to ramble? We can ramble. I mean, we've got a good chunk of talent here, so. <laughs> you could, I suppose you could ramble, but there's, uh, I, I expected this to be uh, somewhat uh, empty and more like an office hours where yeah. people would pop on and ask questions and things like that. All right. I'm going to go dig through the dev list. There are some, some good questions that I saw last week that may not have been answered. 
Actually, I have a question. Jesse, could you talk a bit about what you need to do to uh, get a plugin supporting uh, workflow properly? And let's just assume like a simple plugin. It's like a wrapper or uh, a build step. Yeah, there's no such thing as a, well, there is such a thing as a simple plugin, but most of them aren't. Um, so there is a guide about this, which I can, um, which I'll paste the link into IRC for now. Um, just for expediency, so this is a plugin developer guide. Uh, here it is. And there, basically what you need to do in in the simplest cases is update the core dependency and either switch to some newer APIs or stop using some deprecated APIs. I mean, the, the single most common thing is just that there's a, a more general super type for workflow jobs and runs than is true for they, freestyle they, and Maven and Matrix. They descend from run and job rather than abstract build and abstract project. Right. Uh, reason for that being that abstract project and abstract build have have a whole bunch of assumptions about a a freestyle like universe. You know, one one build slave, one SCM, etc. It just wasn't yeah. flexible enough. In general, it's it's a good idea to go as far up the inheritance tree as you can before you're uh, before you're uh, an object. Yeah. Yeah. Just just. <laughs> Just as, and it's, I've always been an abstract builder project guy because that's generally what I've had to worry about. But then I would run into something where it actually comes from somewhere else and it just gets confusing. So, yeah, if you can use run and you can use job, use run and job. Yeah, that's, so that's the most common thing. And then, and then typically what happens is you make those substitutions and then you see what doesn't compile. And then you'll see some little things like, oh, your plugin was assuming that it could call a method to get the build, the node, or the SCM that something checked out or where something built, and then you have to step back and think a moment. Well, you know, if if my plugin were being used on three different slaves in parallel, then obviously there's not going to be one node that that's doing doing a build step on, and so how do I find that instead? And usually that kind of information you typically get from the workspace parameter that you get passed and so on. Um, and then there's there's a section dealing with data binding. This is not, strictly speaking, workflow specific. It's stuff you ought to do anyway, but it can become mandatory if you want workflow compatibility, so basically just cleaning up all the form binding to not use any tricks and to use consistent patterns everywhere so that you're following conventions for everything. There's a one-to-one -one mapping between fields in your configuration form and getters in your Java class and setters or constructor parameters. So is there the, the, the recommendation for uh, plugins at this point is to only have mandatory parameters in data bound constructor and do everything yep. else in data bound setters. Yep. Yeah, that's the recommendation. That's nice anyway, even yeah. if you're because if you want to introduce new optional properties in the future, then you just have to add a setter and you don't have to do the little dance that people did in the past where ah. you have a, a sequence of twelve different constructors. Eleven of which are deprecated and delegated. Yeah. US one and all that. I I still hit that problem with a plugin that I wrote internally at the previous job that <laughs> uh, when it went to SSH slaves 1.10, suddenly the old constructor wasn't there anymore. Uh, right. And yeah. It's, yeah. It's, sometimes, it's, sometimes people just change the constructor and neglect to leave the old one there, and so then you get linkage errors. Yeah. And, not having to change your constructor is generally a good thing. Uh, so those are the probably the two biggest things. And then for particular kinds of integrations you're doing, there are other little details that 
you need to pay attention to. Now, I, well, I guess I should say for build steps and build wrappers, the the biggest change, which the biggest change for some plugins, for some plugins you don't have to do anything, but the biggest requirement is that any state that you have needs to be safely serializable. Um, so for build steps, usually it, this doesn't really come up because it's expected to be more or less instantaneous. But for build wrappers, this is most of the work in doing conversion in, in most cases because you because a, a build might start and run the opening block of the build wrapper and then Jenkins restarts and then and then it comes back up and you need to get all of your state back exactly the way it was. So you can't be holding open socket connections or stuff like that. You have to have everything in a in a format where you can safely round trip it from disk. So one question I had about this was how do you go from this style, you know, the uh, where you actually have to specify the class uh, to just having it like the bash step or archive step. How do you get that? In? How do you actually get your plugin in supported by the DSL? Uh, you can add your own custom step. I kind of um, recommend people don't, if, the, if there's not any other reason to do it, then don't do it and just wait for Chris K and I to do Jenkins 29922, I just put the link in IRC, which would sort of do that automatically for everybody's plugin without, without, your, without your plugin needing to have any workflow-specific dependencies. So basically, basically that would be sort of a unification of, of systems that are needed by workflow, job DSL plugin, and YAML project plugin so that there's a single consistent way of referring to Jenkins configuration objects from scripty places. Of, of different sorts. I can't vote for it more than once. <laughs> no, I'd love that. Yeah, that's this has been a long standing to do item. Yeah, it's I know we've we've had various chats uh, over the last couple of years uh, regarding figuring out how to unify or at least uh, stop the confusion being quite so bad between uh, job DSL and workflow specifically. Um, mm -hmm. Where there's, it, at first glance, it seems like they're the same thing. They're really not. Um, but there's enough overlap in uh, vocabulary, shall we say, or, or meaning yeah. that it feels like a common, a common way to refer to things would be good. Uh, especially if we yep. can have that getting pushed from the plugin side. Uh, yeah, exactly. So and currently, currently, job DSL plugin solves this by just hard coding um, DSL names for yeah. everything in core and a whole list of plugins, and it Which works. works. But it's not. Yeah. But it's not the way you'd like to do forever. Now we 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 thought about some ways to try to have that auto discover uh, or to auto populate from jo existing jobs and things like that, and. Right. It just was a giant pain, but if there's something else that can generate that that job DSL can work on, what use that would be fantastic. Yeah, the idea would probably be to have some sort of standard, simple annotation that core and plugins could all use to um, to define script friendly names for different things. Well, um, plugin devs, be... plugin Sorry. devs, if you uh, if that's something you want, Jenkins. Two nine nine two two. Vote for it, because uh, I can only vote once unless I create a new user. Um, it's not fair. Koske has like ten users on Jira. He could be able to vote up anything. <laughs> That's true. Now that I think that would be really nice, uh, because better supporting workflow and better supporting job DSL, I think, uh, is the way the plugin should be going. Workflow looks like it's going to keep growing as a major way to be uh, 
writing jobs. And uh, alongside that job DSL, I know that there's people who are already using job DSL in combination with workflow. Yep. Uh, and uh, I swear by job DSL for managing uh, massive arrays of jobs for massive arrays of branches that may differ just enough that you can't use something like the workflow's multi-branch logic. Mm -hmm. uh, Although, if that's true, I would be interested in knowing the details. because It's, like it's, we it's weirdly complex stuff <laughs> when there's like eight series of jobs that depend on a couple different places and variables all over the wazoo. It's enterprise stuff. Uh, but yeah, yeah, there's a lot of opportunities for integration between the two, I think. And yeah, or, 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 there, there or it's common vocabulary, I think, is, is the, the main thing. It's that they, they job DSL does not replace work, is not replaced by workflow. Some no. of what I personally have used job DSL for can be done by workflow probably better, no. but that's more that the jobs that I'm, the, the, the way that uh, my jobs are set up could be better done in workflow. And job DSL is descriptive rather than prescriptive, so it's just saying, what are your jobs? Right. Yeah, I th there's overlap in the sense that certain kinds of advanced job configurations or job chains were always too awkward to express using the GUI, and so one solution to that is to use job DSL. And physically create the same jobs you had before, but from a script. And Workflow provides another way of doing that, where the, the script is the runtime representation rather than a static representation of jobs. But then there's a whole bunch of other uses of job DSL that are very different from that, that, that are quite complementary. Uh, let's see. Anybody else listening have any questions? Or am I just going to have to keep asking Jesse questions? <laughs> in which case, I really should just walk over to his house and ask him in person. <laughs> Jesse, uh, I'm kind of curious. Um, so we've done a lot of things differently with workflow. Um, I'm kind of curious why workflow has um, has documentation on GitHub and why it's checked in, <laughs> and whether that was just sort of a matter of fact thing, or um, if there's an explicit decision behind it. Uh, mainly because I. I just got sick of trying to trying and failing to uh, satisfy a captcha 30 times a day. <laughs> <laughs> and wanted to use Markdown, and it was just much, yeah. much more more comfortable to do it that way. I'm looking forward to the the proposals for to a website content. I think that'll be a lot nicer for everybody. Yeah. One of the things that I've been it's you know sitting in the back of my head to think about is the the model that you have for the workflow plugin repository where there's the readme and then a tutorial and you know contributing and things like that um, that's all like it doesn't make any sense to me for you to write that twice to have something show up on jenkins.io um, but as a matter of incorporating that content when we generate the site that would make a lot of sense to me and I think would be a great um, uh, experience for plugin developers, like you just manage all of your plugin documentation just as, you know, Markdown in your repository as per normal, and then that just gets slurped in and parented under. This is this isn't done, so don't hold me to this. But that could get slurped in under like Jenkins.io slash plugin slash artifact ID, um, and a lot of that stuff could be auto generated to provide a good user experience. Uh, and a good developer experience. But it's something I, I definitely took notice of. Yeah, that would be great. And, and I, I do like having, to some extent, I like having content underneath the plugin repo because it it makes it easy to 
develop additions or tweaks to documentation as part of the pull requests that are introduced in the future. Yeah, that's been really successful with the job DSL plugin. I actually do that for the change log as well. So they just usually have the release notes for a particular feature or bug fix is just prepared as part of the pull request. Lots of merge conflicts that way, but it's OK. Andrew, in lieu of questions, you could write some tests for plugins. That'd be fun to watch. <laughs> nah. That's what I thought. My I head Steven is not together one who willingly. I think Stephen was the only one willingly uh, writing tests at my request yesterday. <laughs> Now, if I could think of a specific plugin that uh, I had worked on enough recently to actually be able to dive in right away, that'd be one thing, but uh, I can't. Ah, Christopher asked, uh, he's wondering if there's a way to improve and encourage feedback between plugin users and developers. Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, blame Tyler? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to tell when you're not getting a response whether it's because they're not actually using it or what. Uh, I mean, the best feedback we've got on that is, uh, we go find a plugin, uh, EC2 plugin, there we go. We can tell installation numbers, but not necessarily usage. I mean, there's some cheating that you can do with some uh, in the usage data for some plugins. If they have custom job types, we can actually tell how many job jobs exist of that custom job type. But uh, otherwise, yeah, it's it's... And it's not always easy to monitor uh, Jira. And, yeah, I don't know. I'd like to have an answer for that. Uh, if anybody has any suggestions for how we can better get feedback from users about uh, their usage of plugins, uh, uh, I'd love to hear it. But that's probably one of those unsolvable problems in a lot of ways. Regrettably. It feels like if you can find that out, you've actually solved a large chunk of open source development right there. Which would be cool, but...
it would be interesting if the wiki page actually had like a voting system for a plugin or like a survey type thing. So we've had discussions in the past about this kind of thing, and I know Tyler's done some work along those lines, but that was years ago, uh, and we never figured out what to do with it, I guess, uh, and I, I don't think it ever had a large enough uh, set of input, because the, the reason why we can get this installation data is because it's not self-reported, it's automated. Um, if it's not automated, it I mean, people aren't not many people are going to uh, even if we had the review system or vote up, vote down. It, it's you know the Amazon review problem. The it's all going to be ones and fives, mainly ones, mm -hmm. um, because it's only the people who are really pissed off who bother to say anything. Uh, voting up and down, Tyler. Uh, reviewing plugins, uh, that kind of thing. What was that? I came into the end of that sentence. So Chris had asked about better ways of getting feedback from users to plugin devs, uh, and Steve brought up uh, voting, reviewing, that kind of thing, and I know you've done stuff in that area before, but I'm not sure we ever actually got any value out of that. Yeah, so on the uh, on the Jenkins page, like jenkinsci.org, when you click into a change log, and part of what I think has been uh, the problem with this form of feedback is that it has been so hidden. Um, there's you know a means to rate uh, Jenkins core releases, um, and you know we might get twenty or thirty ratings for each release, which is whatever. But for plugins, there's no such mechanism right now. And Gus, who I've been working with to come up with some new concepts and wireframes for a revamped Jenkins.io site, uh, he's been, I would say, adamant about providing some sort of per-plugin review mechanism. I've been on the uh, on a much more skeptical side of the fence in that I personally don't find, you know, App Store style or Yelp style reviews very useful in the context of a plugin because a, you know, a plus one doesn't tell me much if it's applied to a plugin. It may tell me a lot if it applies to a plugin release. Um, and it's a very sort of coarse level of feedback. So there's... I, I definitely agree with your uh, your desires, Chris, on, on getting better uh, feedback mechanisms from plugin users to plugin developers. Um, there's not been much that I've seen that's been really interesting thus far that would allow us to get the right kind of feedback, if that makes sense. Like, you know, the on the IRC channel, they're talking a little bit about the uh, the anonymous usage data that can be sent along. Um, from a Jenkins master that if you opt in from a Jenkins master to uh, to the Jenkins infrastructure, there's, I think, interesting automated reports that we could provide to plugin developers based on that information. And of course it is opt-in only, so it would give you uh, a, a subset of information that's available. But it would also be aggregated data, right? So it wouldn't be, you know, you, you might get like 500 reports or error reports or, or something like that, but getting to understand how users are using the plugin um, or whether functionality has been incorrect for them or whether they're focusing on different different functionality in your plugin than you might uh, you might expect is it's a big a big problem to uh, to address. Yeah, it really would have to be. Uh more specific to a single plugin, uh, if we wanted to get that kind of more granular usage data, again, still aggregate, uh, to say, well, what like, like like Christopher was mentioning, the context of the Android plugin, what permutations of uh, uh, versions and platforms, et cetera, are being used. So this might be a, a, a 
question that you or Jesse could answer. Is there a is there a extension point for instrumenting your plugin to report anonymous usage data, or is that really driven just out of core? Does that question make sense? I'm fairly certain it's just driven out of core. Uh, that might be something interesting we could explore. Like, if I gave you a new extension point that said, um, you know, similar to the, the graphite uh, metrics framework, if I could say, you know, when this functionality is being used, increment a counter or something like that, and that data gets sent up to Jenkins uh, if the user's opted in to send that anonymous usage data. Um, plugin developers could start to instrument their own plugins, and you know, if you're interested in seeing how many people are using this build step, that you know, the the obligation would basically fall back onto the plugin developer to say, when this build step is being used, increment the counter or something like that, um, and that might be a way forward for us. Just spitballing here. Yeah, I think there's already something which counts number of job types and things like that. Yeah. That's that's stuff that can be calculated mechanically without knowing anything about the plugin. There might be something plugin specific you want to add. You know, just as you can register an extension to the metrics plugin to spit back you know, live data to a monitoring tool and you can register an extension to support core plugin to add something to support bundles. Be nice to have something you could register to add usage information like this. It looks like the usage statistics is just a page decorator. Uh, there's nothing pluggable in it right now, but we'd have to really think about what uh, we couldn't. I, I, I would not be comfortable just adding an extension point to say, okay, now this is in there. I think we'd want to have uh, specific callouts for opting in for each plugin. Um, since core it's more established, uh, but and more general. But while the with the plugins, it can be a lot more invasive. Something to consider, though. So we've got um, in this session scheduled, not that any of that matters because it's totally ad hoc, um, eight more minutes. Um, I wonder uh, if maybe ranting about some of the Jenkins 3.0 stuff might be fun. <laughs> 3.0? Yeah, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of fun discussion on the mailing list that that Kosuke, you know, said, please let's let's address this in Jenkins 3.0, but like pie in the sky, really optimistic improvements that we can make to uh to the plugin ecosystem. Since we're on the subject with the the usage data, um, I'm wondering if there's other cool things that that would be fun to talk about. Storage backend was one that I know you brought up. Yeah, storage backend is my hobby horse, uh, my windmill to tilt at. Uh, that to have some kind of 
probably optional uh, way to store build results, test results, the large scale, generally fairly structured data so that you could actually query it in a meaningful way. Because I've seen too many people try to use the Jenkins API uh, as a way to do querying about test results and things like that uh, for dashboards and such. Uh, when you've got 5,000 tests in a run and you've got 16 matrix uh, uh, runs as part of that and you run it twice a day and there's 80,000 mm -hmm. other builds. Well, yeah, and when you get to that point, Jacob just eventually says, mm, no, I'm going to take a while. Um, beyond bugs that have been found and fixed in terms of uh, annoying locks and things like that, I mean, it's, unless it's all in memory, which it can't be, it's going to always take to some time to, to gather historical data and trends and that kind of thing. Uh, so some way to offload that that's actually more native to Jenkins and not like something like the build failure analyzer's attempt to do things like that, that is a good idea, but it ends up kind of going a little batty with performance issues sometimes, uh, would be quite nice. So when you, when you first talked about this on the, uh, on the mailing list, yes. the, the first thing that popped up into my head was actually a very different uh, problem to be solved um, around that to where I was thinking, you know, one of the big challenges in having any kind of highly available or redundant yeah. Jenkins cluster is that, you know, plugins, everything like goes into Jenkins home and messes around with a bunch of the files um, uh, or Jenkins on behalf of plugins touches a lot of files to where I was thinking you were going down the route of like abstracting the, um, you know, saying Jenkins plugins, you don't get to touch disk anymore. I will give you a storage API um, if you need to persist something. And then Jenkins itself would also use that. So if I wanted to implement, you know, uh, a GFS storage layer, yeah. I, I would be able to uh, because I would know that nothing is going to use syscalls to get past me. Uh, no, that that is what I would to like to see, but uh, various people scared me off of that one, uh, implying that the uh, <laughs> viability of that was somewhere between nil and ultra nil. Um, nice. So ultra nil. Uh, <laughs> so part of why I wanted to target the build results and test results specifically is that that's uh, something that is more atomized, it's more uh, self-contained. It seemed like a, a good venue for, uh, that, that even on its own would provide value even if we couldn't take it uh, further to the level that you're talking about, but it would be a good proof of concept. Um, but I need to pick that back up and start thinking about that more. Uh, I mean, what other kind of stuff is there that we'd like to see in plugin dev that we don't have now, or things we'd like to get rid of that we have now? Uh, all that old jQuery nonsense. Tom, Tom's actually been, Tom Fennelly has been doing some really good work in the uh, in the modularization of the front end, which I, I'm sure everybody that has built a plugin is absolutely in love with Jelly. But we've see, gotta, we've got to come into this century with some I, of the front-end technologies that we're using. I, I, part of me wants Jelly to live on forever for its sheer dementedness. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, and I love that the Groovy view is really just a way of writing Jelly in Groovy. Um, <laughs> I don't think it's about loving Jelly. It's about the fact that if you want to be compatible with anything else, you have to, you have to interact with the APIs and systems or in place and that are expecting extensions to behave in certain ways. It would be kind of, I mean, at least for anything touching on config files, it's true. maybe it's less true for pages that are just, you know, displaying some sort of data where you're more or less in control of the whole page. Yeah, it's UIs. I don't know UIs. I 
part of why I love Jenkins when I got started uh, with it oh so many years ago was that I didn't have to think about a UI. I could just go, oh, if I specify some things here, then it, there's a, oh, cool, it just shows up. Of course, that can lead to things like the Throttle Concurrent Builds plugin UI, which never did anything the way I wanted it to, but still. Jesse, yeah, I'm kind of curious about uh, the, I'm not sure I fully understand the point that you're making there with, with Joey. I mean, it's executable XML, and from the, to like when I look at when I look at Jenkins like a a web application, there's this awkward blurring of the lines between the presentation layer and the back end. And to from my perspective, Jelly is exacerbating some of that problem for the plugin developer to where there's not a clean separation um, between what you would write in in Jelly and what you know. If I were building a new web application, I would just write. You know, some some backbone modules in JavaScript or something like that. I'm not sure I understand. Right, but we're not writing a new web application. <laughs> so we're trying to incrementally right. patch an old web application. <laughs> <laughs> and there's just a lot of there's just a lot of places where you're not given a choice. The API states that in order for your plugin to implement a certain extension point, you are given the opportunity to inject a block of HTML into, you know, that must consist of table rows into the following location. And in order to interact with anything, any other plugins and features, it has to use the following set of, of controls in libform or whatever in a particular way. Um, so, I mean, it's not about Jelly, it's, it's about the the whole way in which um, static HTML pages are composed from bits and pieces of plugins mm -hmm. in, in the application as a whole. That's really hard to, that's not something you can just change overnight. Right. So, you, I mean, your plugin is free to use any kind of web framework you want for pages that it completely owns. You know, if you just you just have you you would have a main panel and a side panel maybe optionally, and for the rest of it you can do whatever you think is appropriate. But most plugins aren't in that position. They're trying to contribute something to an existing page, so there has to be some API for what they can contribute. And the, the API that we all of the APIs that we have are based on. Uh, HTML fragment contribution. Right. Do you think we're stuck with that forever? Well, until someone's... I mean, until someone's clever enough to figure out how to get around it. I mean, you can, you can define new APIs that aren't based on that model, and people can start to use them um, as long as it doesn't need to interact directly with the old pages. So, you know, for, for things like build step configuration or something, I don't see any, any way around it for the foreseeable future. Because that's just deeply baked in. And for, for plugins that are doing more like reporting pages or sort of standalone UI, then they have more freedom. 